Praise God. Well, praise God. So I did something kind of unique this time. Um, for those of you guys who have heard me uh, teach before, um, I really like being prepared. And my wife knows that. I have lots of notes, man, lots and lots of notes on Scripture and Bible and things on God. And uh, she made a statement to me. I'm not going to quote it perfectly, but she said something like, um, you know, sometimes you don't need to be prepared. You just need the Lord, right? You need that revelation. And uh, so I'm going to do something really unique today. I haven't really studied this week. I'm just going to talk to you all out of my heart. Is that okay? Amen. 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 All right. Um, I want to give, I, I, just, I can't walk away from it. Um, where's Ken? Where is he? Ken. Yeah, I think he just went in the nursery. Uh, just whenever you can. Uh, I want to give you, I want to encourage you guys to reach out and love on him. There he is. Kim, we just want to say thank you for always running everything up there. Dude, we appreciate you. I don't know why that was big on my heart today, but dude, you are a huge piece, even though you sit behind the curtain. And we love you, man. We just want to say thank you, dude. Um, Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for what you're going to do today. We pray for open ears, open hearts. Um, and open spirits, Father, for what you have for us. We love you, Lord. We give you praise. In Jesus' name, we all said, Amen. 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 So, what's on my heart today is something I, I've been kind of living through um, the last few weeks, but it's also something that the Lord shared with me a few years ago. Um, you know, when I, the first time I taught at Cross Kingdom here, I taught on the hope of God, right? And the Lord just kind of sent me down this path of the characteristics of God. It's really easy in today's world to say God, right? <clears throat> like, oh, he's God. Okay, God did that. It's such a loose term. We've overused it so much. I mean, y'all you have heard me talk about it. We even use it in movies, like Thor, like he's a God. No, he ain't. But it's weird because we, we pin that on uh, folks like Thor and Hulk and these guys as God, and it starts to degrade the being that created the universe. You understand? He spoke. He said, "Light, bam." That's your father. There's another term that, especially in today's society, I mean, you look at over the last couple of decades and how society has degraded especially the family union. <clears throat> I mean, we're there's people out there still struggling to figure out if there's boys or girls. <clears throat> and you that seems subtle. That seems like something that we as believers should just ignore. But that is degrading the family unit. The power of the father and the mother. And both are important. I don't want to stand up here and tell you today and say, oh, we, we just need all fathers. No, we need some moms. Some of you guys are block-headed. I am, and my wife often helps pull that back, and she shares the other side of God, that feminine side, the love of music, the love of dance. <clears throat> you know, my kids and I, we were looking at some history stuff the other day, and uh, there was a king in the, I don't know, it was like the 12th century. He said, don't ever give a warrior a sword if he doesn't know how to dance. It's an interesting statement. Well, what's he talking about? You give somebody who's brutal and barbaric a sword, what do they become? Killers, dictators, men who are controlled by their flesh. So if you give a sword to a guy who likes to dance, he appreciates what? Life, right? It's a powerful, it's a small little statement, but it's such a powerful one, right? The second time I taught, I taught on the goodness of God. How good he is. We, we are growing up, um, we have grown up in the last 50 years, not really knowing if God's good, right? Questions started seeping into the church like, why does God want me sick? Which is interesting because if you open your Bible, all he did was ever heal anybody. <clears throat> but see how that stuff starts to thread in. Well, well, how would God allow this? First of all, goes back to that God thing. Why are we, what position do we feel like we are in 
to question God. He has a much bigger picture of what is happening in the world. <clears throat> well, what is it? It's our flesh. And what did Jesus say? You know, he told us to pick up our cross and go with him. Well, what's our cross? It's literally the only thing he did not bear. He did not bear himself on the cross. Yes, he did not, he did not bear it all on the cross. It's your flesh. You still have a will. Right? And then you start see you get things that seep into the church like um, you know, whatever whatever God whatever happens is God's will. You don't really believe that at your core. We say that because we don't really have an answer and we don't really want to press in to find out the true nature of God. So it's really easy to say that. But then we start bringing up young people and youth and people in the world start hearing that, well, whatever happened, you know, whoever died of cancer, well, it must have been God's will. That's such a cop out. You don't really believe that. Because if I got off this stage, walked down there and slapped you across the face, you wouldn't be mad. Because it's God's will. See, you don't really, but we don't really believe that at our core. That whatever happens is God's will. No, it's our cop out for how we handle life. God said there would be trials. What else did he say? I'll never leave you or forsake you. I'll walk through it with you. He sent his son to the cross so that we could have the power to overcome sickness and disease. Isabel, did the power of God overcome sickness and disease? Yes, ma'am. If y'all don't know it, she was uh, born with a defect from birth, and God straightened it out at camp. Amen. Now, see, that's, come on, that deserves something, y'all. That's awesome. But you know what? People could look at her and say, you know what? It must have been God's will. No, God's will was to meet her at Revival Youth Camp and introduce himself and say, let me straighten that out for you. But see, we don't expect that in our lives. And we need to own that. We don't expect that in our own lives. And we have such audacity. We have such audacity as humans. Half the stuff that we say to God, we would never let our kids say to us. We don't. It's amazing. I mean, you, you think about some of the things you hear in, 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 from people who call themselves Christian. You're standing at war memorials calling soldiers who's lost their friends murderers. Anyway, so today, that was my introduction. <laughs> Today, I want to introduce you to, guys to just another, another facet, another characteristic of God. It's called loyalty. God is loyal. He's more loyal than you will ever be. I can tell you that. And I want to show you this because I had an interesting conversation with a lady one time in, in, up in Woodland Park where we came from. Um, wonderful lady. Hurt, damaged. Found out I was a pastor. Um, and of course... I love, I love the audacity of, of teens and kids and, um, God, I love you guys. Let me tell y'all, I, I want, hold on. I want to tell y'all something for just a second. I would go to war with any one of y'all. Just so you know that you would embarrass yourselves to help me. And I commit to you. I will embarrass myself to love on you and to walk through life with you guys. Y'all are so worth it. It's ridiculous how much I love y'all. Amen. Sorry. Okay, back it up. <clears throat> I love it, man. Yeah, I don't know if y'all noticed it. Since they met God, since they really got a revelation of who the Father is, you can't walk through there and somebody start praying for you without 20 people touching you. Why aren't the rest of us like that? I'm going to leave that there. All right, so loyalty. <clears throat> um, you know, and I was talking to this lady, and she brought up, she asked me how I could be a pastor, how, how I could teach in church about a God who's so angry and vengeful, full of wrath and killing everybody, right? 
And I could see that. I could actually see, in the, especially in the Old Testament, where she would pick that up. I mean, Pharaoh, he, you know, Pharaoh and the Egyptians, they drowned a whole army in the Red Sea, right? Okay. You can choose to see God through whatever lens of anger or offense you want to live with. I mean, I can have both sides of those arguments. I, and I'm not, I don't even, I wouldn't even consider myself a scholar in the Bible, but I could have both sides of those arguments. You can see God however you want to see him based on what's happened to you in life and your experiences. I will also point out God gave him a lot of opportunity to repent. See, most of us don't want to see that. And it started subtle. It started real subtle. Then it, then it turned up. Moses kept coming back. Hey, let God's people go. And here's like the chance, you know. Anyway, so I want to share this with you. This is kind of where this message was birthed out of. Um, and y'all know me. I'm going to go to Scripture. I want you to lay his eyes on it. I hope you brought your Bible. Um, it's good to just hear pages turn and go see it for yourself. But let's start in Genesis. I'm going to go to Genesis 4. We're going, to talk, we're going to start with Cain and Abel. And I'm going to give you a couple examples in the Old Testament. And I'm going to finish up with a New Testament version. So you can't say, oh, everything he was talking about was just in one side of the book. right? So let's go to, let's go to Genesis 4. Verse 1. Now Adam knew his wife. I'm going to stop there. They didn't, they didn't text each other that new. I'm going to let you all look that up. <clears throat> so he knew his wife. And she conceived and bore Cain and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Then she bore again, this time her his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep and Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of fruit of the ground to the Lord. Verse 4. Abel also brought the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering. But he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was angry and his countenance fell. I want to pause here. Now, I want to share something with you guys. Like I mentioned when we started this, I'm going to pull out just a little bit of revelation from me. I'm going to take a little liberal, uh, what's the word, Ben? I'm going to take some liberality here. I just want to show you, I want to show you the revelation the Lord gave me and hope it opens something in you, okay? So this verse here, verse 5 but he did not respect Cain and his offering now this is the start of what's happening in this story God didn't respect his offering does God have a right to not respect what you offer him yes okay he's God right but I have actually you, you'll hear people talk about this and want to know, well, why did God not respect it? Who cares? See, that why is what's going to get you in trouble in life. Again, it goes back to he is God. Okay? God doesn't have to go around explaining himself to you. Amen? Amen? I know this is rough, guys, but I, I promise you it's going to end really good. Amen. Just, just stay with me. Bill Johnson said right after Benny passed in his sermon, he said, I don't ever want my why to take me away from the heart of God. That's a powerful statement. Let's keep going. So Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. Well, why is he angry? That seems odd, right, if you're reading this story. How in the world could Cain be angry? I mean, he brought an offering that the Lord didn't respect. Okay? Why would you be angry? Well, bitterness sets in, right? Offense sets in. Have any of us done that before? All th- I love how all the kids are raising their hands and like none of the adults are like. <laughs> Amen. <clears throat> so verse 6. So the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry and why has your countenance fallen? Who's he really at? Who does he really want to know this answer? Cain. You think God doesn't already know why? 
But he's asking the question, why? Because Cain needs to see this, right? Verse 7, if you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at your door, and its desire is for you, okay? This is a very interesting statement. God, remember, Adam and Eve, God separated from man, right? They're out of the garden now, right? And God is still telling Cain, hey, man, why are you mad at me? And here's the answer. If you, if you give a good offering, will you not be accepted? And what's he telling them? Be careful about what's in you. Sin is laying at your doorstep, right? Okay, so God doesn't have to say that to him. I want to help y'all. God doesn't have to say that to him, does not have to reveal that to him. See that whole vengeful, angry God thing that we love to like pin on him every time it's convenient for us? Look at how he's walking Cain through this on his own, of his own accord. Finish up this sentence. Same, 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 uh, same verse here, verse 7. But you should rule over it. Notice he did not say, Hey, Cain, hand it to me and I'll fix all your issues. He told Cain, you rule over it. You. How many of us need to take ownership of our own sin? And that ain't the, it ain't the devil attacking you as much as it you really want to. That's okay. I'm on a rabbit trail. Y'all just being quiet. So I'm on a rabbit trail. The devil gets a lot more credit than he deserves. In church, we love, I mean, if it ain't God we're blaming, well, then it's the devil. Oh, the devil made me do it. You selfish, your flesh wanted to do it, and you know it. We act like we are completely sinless, and the devil just made me do it, or God made it happen to me. Guys, we have a flesh. You have a flesh. And what's weird is like, if you were ministering to anybody else in this room, you'd be like, that's your flesh. That is your flesh. When it comes to me, it's like, man, the devil did it. The devil made me. I don't even know why. Okay, all right. We're going to keep moving on. Verse 8. Now Cain talked to Abel, his brother. And it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. Okay, did the devil make Cain do it? Uh, you'll hear that preached in, in church with a big C. Not here. Justin knows the word, and I love it. Cain rose up and killed his brother. Why? Jealousy. Je he was jealous, so he killed his brother. Okay? God didn't make him do it. God just warned him not to do it. God just told him, you handle it. Sin is knocking at your door. Take charge. Right? So what did Cain do? He ignored him. Went out and killed his brother. All right, so let's keep reading the story. Verse 9. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel your brother? Okay, does God not know where Abel is? Okay. God knows where Abel is, y'all. Okay? <clears throat> and he said, Who's he? This is Cain here, right? I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? Now, let me tell you something. In this moment, if God would have been a mama, she'd have slapped him so hard. Woo! You, you talking to me like that? Dude, I will. Mm-hmm. But listen to the audacity in Cain's voice. Y'all, like, I'm telling y'all, if y'all will pick up your Bible and read it with the heart of God and listen to your spirit, he'll reveal stuff like this to you. Cain looks at God like, I don't know, what am I his keeper? Before I make you dirt, you want to try again. Like, I see so many faces coming. You know, like, I want to be, I want to really want to see that replay. Just picture God. What's he like? Ooh, he said that to you. Y'all back up. There's going to be a new mountain here any moment. 
Y'all read the Bible for what it is. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said to him, what have you done that the voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground? So now you are cursed from the earth, which, it is, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you till the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength to you. A fugitive and a vagabond, you will be on the earth. Now that's interesting. This is an interesting paragraph. I want to highlight to you, God never one time said, this is what I'm doing to you. But that's how the church will read it. God just said, you made a decision. Here's the consequence. Let me break this down for you. This is the equivalent of your, your kid, your, your son or daughter, sticking their hand in the fire, right? After you've told them 15 times, if you do that, it's going to burn. They do it, get burned and go, Dad, why would you do that to me? Like that seems ridiculous in our perspective. We do it all the time to God. Here Cain is, smashed his brother's head in, killed him, and God's just saying, hey, now this is what's happened. I told you to control your sin. And then you'll get the other side of this coin from other people who want to know the whys, right, who keep walking down there. Well, why did God allow Cain to do it? Because he gave us a will. That right there will answer lots of your questions about war, rape, murder. Can God step in and do it? Can he physically, he, can he remove your will? That's a question. I love that hesitation. No, because it's not who he is. And we got to get past this whole thing that, that, that God is not. When, God, when people say God is love, you understand it's not a emotion of his. It is physically who he is. And when you get that revelation, you will understand that God sees everything that happens on this earth. The good and he sees every bad. Every girl sold. Every young man sent to war who dies on a battlefield. And I'm going to step out on them. I'm going, to take, I'm going to take an opportunity here. You can't conceive how much that weighs on the Lord. But he loves the guy that sells her and wants him to be redeemed too. He loves the guy in Africa who's pulling the trigger, killing kids. He wants him to be redeemed too. That's hard. That's a lot to swallow. But God is love. He is loyal till your last day. We struggle with that. We don't have a reference point for that because we're so used to being superficial as human beings that somebody doesn't bring a birthday present to my party and you get offended. Now they're not my friend. They're not my BFF. Or one of your friends says, hey, that dress is a little too tight. You might want to shop a size up. I love how it's like the ladies that laugh at that one. Because <laughs> guys don't care. Be like, you think I need bigger pants? <laughs> Me too. You know, we don't care. <clears throat> we get offended at the littlest things, and we walk away from our friends. That's not who God is. It's who he is. It's in his nature. Okay. So back to the story of Cain. Let's finish this up. I love this. Now, who committed the sin? Cain. Who was warned about it? Cain. Okay, so this is set. The stage is set, right? And Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. 
Surely you have driven me out this day. Who's he blaming? Here we go. Must be a Christian. All right. <clears throat> Surely you have driven me out this day from the face of the ground. I shall be hidden from your face. I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond on the earth. And it will happen that anyone who finds me will kill me. Now, did God say that? Here we go again, twisting what God said. Right? This, this is a, a, a born-in part of human nature. We will take what God said and twist it. Right? So what's Cain doing right now? He's pouting. Right? He's pouting. Verse 15. And the Lord said to him, Therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance will be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark on Cain, lest anyone find him should kill him. Now what did God do? God just protected him the rest of his life. Did he have to? No. But he's the best friend you'll ever have. Even right after he got blamed. He told Cain not to do it. Told him to take over. Told him to manage his sin. He killed his brother. And now God marks him and says, Nobody will lay a hand on you. Lest sevenfold be returned to them. I'm still looking for that angry, vengeance-filled God who's like mad at everybody. Okay, well, that's not enough. Okay, let's go scroll over here with me to uh, Genesis 20. Oh, good Lord. I don't want to keep you all too long. Thank you, Father. Okay, I'm going to speed up, y'all. I know this is a lot. <clears throat> all right, we're going to talk about, we're going to bring, we're going to another story, another man, Abraham, right? Verse 15 or chapter 15, God makes a covenant with Abraham. Who in here is saved and has a covenant with God? Okay. We have, I don't feel like as a big church, we have done a good job at defining what a covenant means. You are in a business partner relationship, blood covenant with God Almighty. Okay? If you don't keep your side of the covenant, what does that mean for God? Somebody said it. Say it louder. Nothing. God will keep his side, regardless of what you do. God is a man of his word and a woman of his word. He's everything. Okay? He will keep his word to you. Okay? All right, here we go. Chapter 20, verse 1. And Abraham journeyed uh, south and dwelt in Kadesh, and sure, because he wasn't very sure, but he stayed in Gerar. Verse 2. Now Abraham said of Sarah his wife, she is my sister. I love you ladies that just shake your head. So to set the stage for you guys who don't know this, this story. So Abraham has told Sarah, hey, we're going to this land. And like, I need you to say you're my sister. Right? And Sarah agrees. Okay? Well, why? He, Abraham's afraid right? He's, let me be honest. He's afraid. Okay. Man, this is a really good story. Y'all need to read it if you don't have time. Okay. But pressing on. All right. Verse two. Now Abraham said of his wife, um, she is my sister. And Abimelech, the king of Gerar sent and took Sarah. Verse three, but God came to Abimelech in a dream at night and said to him, indeed, you are a dead man because of the woman whom you have taken for she is a man's wife. But Abimelech had not come near her. And he says to the Lord, Lord, will you slay a righteous nation also? Did he not say to me, she is my sister? And she even, uh, even said herself that he is my brother. In the integrity of my heart and the innocence of my hands, I have done this. Now, this is interesting. Now, a lot of people can look at this story and look at Abimelech and be like, well, God, why would God do that to him? Well, here's the key, and I, we teach the youth this. Don't take a text out of context or you get all three of you. Come on, man. Don't take a text out of context or you're going to get conned. Okay? There's the rest of the story. Let's read it. And God said to him in a dream, Yes, I know you did this in the integrity of your heart, for I have withheld you from sinning against me. 
Therefore, I did not let you touch her. Okay? In this moment, God is protecting Abimelech and Sarah despite Abraham being an idiot. Okay, we're going to go back to this whole loyal thing. Look at how God is being God in a moment and protecting. Here we go. Now, therefore, verse 7, restore the man's wife, for he is a prophet, and he will pray for you, and you shall live. But if you do not restore her, know that you will surely die, you and all the yours. Now, this is interesting. You can read that statement and be angry at God. You could get angry at the Lord for that. But he's God. Who is his covenant with? Abraham. Who violated the covenant? Abimelech. He took Sarah. But Abimelech knows he's in it, or God knows Abimelech is innocent. So he's saying, look, I have my side of this covenant. You're a dead man. Unless. You notice God did not walk out on his covenant. Y'all, this is more powerful than I think you're giving it credence. God has woken him up and said, hey, before you do this thing, here's your opportunity to repent and make it right. But did God step in and say, hey, I won't kill you? No. He said, Abraham has to pray for you so that you live. Who is the dude in the story who's messing all of it up? Who's got the covenant with God? Abraham. Whose corner in this story is God just like all in? Despite the fact that he is like a royal mess up. I didn't say the other word. Screw. I was going to say screw up. Okay. For those of y'all who are thinking all unrighteous. He's in Abraham's corner, but he is still from across the ring protecting Abimelech and not violating his covenant. Y'all, this is what God is doing for you every day of your life. Every day of your life. Now, I want to get into, an, I want to get into another section, and I, 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 don't, I don't want to keep you all here all day. The rest of the story goes on. Abraham prays for Abimelech, and Abimelech gives him land and sheep and cattle, and money, and probably an angry wife back, and a whole bunch of other stuff. (laughs) Did Abraham do anything to deserve that? Did God do it for him anyway? If God is for me, who can be against me? This applies to you. But you have to let it. You've got to stop speaking against God. Well, I guess God made me sick. You're taking what he did for you at the cross and setting it down and going, I choose sickness because it must be from God. He ripped a veil apart so that you'd never have to be sick again so that you could hear his voice. Abraham has tanked it. And there are people sitting here right now that think you've messed up so much. Oh, I just don't know if God will forgive me. Who in here has given away your wife? I did not say who in here wants to give away their wife. I said who in here has given away their wife. Nobody, right? Anybody in here giving away a husband? Tinted, right? Amen. That's okay. Y'all think about this. See, I mean, I, I want to, Lord, let revelation come. I want, I want to, you to get out of your mind and your soul for a second and look at your father and what he does for you. This is a great version. This is used a lot about how angry God could be. Well, he threatened Abimelech. No, he saved Abimelech's life. That's what he did. But you got to read the whole verse. You got to read the whole chapter. 
And Abraham walks away wealthy. Wealthy. Lands and sheep and goats and his wife back. He walks away from this untouched. Because he has a covenant with God. Who in here has a covenant with God? All right. I'm going to skip that. Skip that. Praise God. Okay. Uh, Let's go to Matthew 26. Stay with me. Thank you guys for giving me time. Thank you for allowing me to share just a little bit of revelation that the Lord has given me. All right. This is interesting because, you know, if if you've walked in the faith for any amount of time, you understood that who, who sold out Jesus? Okay, maybe you're all new Christians. <clears throat> so there was a guy who was a disciple who sold out Jesus. His name was? Judas. Judas. Okay, everybody just got saved. You see that? Everybody knew the story suddenly. So Judas sells out Jesus, right? Um, I once, when I was sitting up at Karis, I was getting my degree in uh, biblical studies. Um, I had this thought come to me once. That, and I think one of the teachers was asking the question, like, who in the who in the Bible is the greatest example of love to you? A lot of people would say John, the disciple John, right? Because he self proclaimed, "I am the disciple that Jesus loves," right? Um, so that's easy. If you were to ask me this question, the example of the greatest example of love in the Bible to me, outside of what Jesus did for us right? That's obvious. It's Judas. I'm going to show you how I got there. Okay. This, like I said, I'm going to teach you. I want to talk to you out of my own revelation. Okay. So Matthew 26 and verse, let's start in verse 17. Now on the first day of the feast of the unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying to him, where do you want us to prepare the Passover? And he said, go into the city and a certain man say to him, the teacher says, my time is in hand and I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared the Passover. Verse 20, when evening had come, he had sat down with the 12. Now they were eating and he said, assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. Now, okay, I want to, I want to take it. Sorry, I don't know what that was, <laughs> but I want to take a minute. Like, I really want to talk to you men for a second, okay? So you have invited 12 of your best friends to your house, right? Y'all sit down at the table, and one of you looks at everybody else and goes, one of you's betrayed me. Like, I don't want you to read past that scripture so fast that it's, oh, Jesus sat down, oh, one of y'all's going to betray me. Oh, yeah, and we know how the rest of the story goes. I want you to, this is, when you read the Bible, this is how you get revelation, y'all. When you start to unpack and put yourself in the scene. I am at the table. Jesus, who did more miracles than they said they could write books for. God, rabbi, just sat down and goes, one of you is going to betray me. Like, ooh. Ooh. Right? Right? go through the stages of what happened in your heart, right? Like, so the first thing is like, was oh, it me? Well, I don't know. Is it one of them? Well, who could it be, right? And so here we go, all right? So they're going to start asking the question. All right, we set the stage. <clears throat> Verse 22, and they were exceedingly sorrowful, and each one of them began saying, Lord, is it I? Now, this is interesting. You've got 12 disciples sitting around a table all asking, Lord, is it I? And what did Jesus say? It's Judas. Y'all, it's Judas. <laughs> this sap sucker's going to sell me out. How many of us would do that? How many of us would fillet one of another, men, in order to make a point? And here Jesus is, sitting at the table with him, and all the disciples are asking, Right? Well, then why would Jesus even bring it up if he doesn't say? I would challenge you. Here, I'm going to share a little bit of my revelation. Jesus is telling the 12 so they know this has to happen. 
He's not looking for them to fix it. But we're guys. We like fixing stuff. You don't walk up to me and say, you're a sorry sap sucker and walk away. Like, I want to know the rest. Like, what? What did I do? What happened? How can I fix it? You know? But Jesus doesn't have that heart right now. So again, set the stage. All these disciples are asking, who? Who is it, Lord? Who is it, Lord? Right? Verse 24, what is it? Verse, uh, where was I? Oh, 23. And he answered and said, he who dipped his hand with me in this dish will betray me. Okay, so, so what did he just do right there? I love that. Thank you, Lord. Get a new revelation all the time. What did he say? He confirmed that it's somebody in this room. That's what he did. Because what do we do as men? Well, I mean, we're all asking who it is, and Jesus ain't telling us, so maybe it's somebody we know. Maybe it's like one of the, one of the 15, like the two dudes standing outside at the door. Maybe one of them. Maybe it's somebody else. I, I don't know. But obviously it ain't one of us because Jesus ain't said, right? All he did say was, it's somebody who's dipped their, their hand in here with me. So what he just confirmed was, it is one of the people sitting at this table. Okay? Verse 24. The Son of Man indeed goes just as it is written. That's interesting. What did he tie it back to? He didn't point at somebody and say it's his fault. He said, this has to happen like it was written. Y'all, put your emotions aside. We're not going to beat each other up in this room or at dinner. Y'all need to know this has to happen. And it's somebody here. But guys, let it go. This has to happen. Okay? Here we go. But woe to the man for whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. Okay. Again, I'm going to share with you. I'm always worried about cameras. I'm going to share with y'all about what happened in this statement to me, what, the way I read this, okay? Just like with Abimelech, Jesus is trying to talk to somebody in the room and say, hey, don't do this. We all know it has to happen, right? Right? Okay. Y'all, I know I'm losing you here, but stay with me for just a second. How many times have we asked the Lord about the terrible things that happen on this earth and we blame him for it? But God allows will of man to happen and he uses it for redemption. Listen to what I just said. I did not say... God made it happen so he could bring out redemption. That is not what I said. I said he allowed it to happen and then brought redemption out of it. I know some of y'all, it's okay to train wreck on that for a minute. Did God stop Abraham from giving up Sarah? But Abraham walked out with what? With land and cattle did God stop Judas from giving up Jesus but what did we walk out with y'all need to grab that y'all need to grab hold of that did God stop Judas did God put Judas up on a sacrifice no God wants Judas as much as everybody else But out of what Judas did, we got redemption, y'all. That's a huge statement, y'all. Just like when Abraham gave up Sarah and he walked out wealthy. Judas gave up Jesus and we walked out wealthy. Okay. All right, I'm going to let y'all marinate on that. Let's keep going. Then Judas said, um, who was betraying him? Uh, sorry. Then Judas, who was betraying him, answered and said, Rabbi, is it I? Is it I? And he said to him, you have said it. Now, this is interesting. Keep in mind, there are 12 people, 12 men, right, sitting around this table. They're all asking who it is. 
And Jesus identified, lets Judas know, you said it. You men, I want you to search your heart right now. If you were sitting with your 12 best friends, the people you've lived with for the last three years, changed lives with, and you heard about the one who sold out the other, would you just be like, oh, Jesus got it. He handled it. You can be honest with yourself. Did Jesus tell Judas it was him in a way that the other 11 had no idea what was happening? I don't know. Scripture doesn't say it, but I'm a man, and I know what I would do in those stories. And you can read here later. We're going to keep reading. Go to verse 47. And while he was speaking, behold, Judas, one of the twelve, with a great multitude, with swords and clubs, came from the chief priests and elders of the people. This is interesting to me. Because, like, I know the disciples took time to get revelation. But I, I can't help but read that and just think, this is a very dense group of guys. <laughs> stupid. I'll just use the word stupid. The spirit of stupid had come over them. Because again, I got you we, back at back Passover, right? Twelve of us are sitting around the table. We all leaving except the one who did it. All the rest of us are leaving. We don't know who it is. Judas comes towards the master with a group full of pitchfork, with a, with a group full of guys and, and people with pitchforks and clubs and stuff. And they're still wondering who it is. Think about that. Well, Ben, why would you say that? How do you know that? Well, they didn't cut Judas's ear off. Okay, it's li- I'm, I'm taking some liberalities, but I want you to stay with me here. And we're going to end it here. Now his betrayer had given them a sign, all the people with clubs and stuff. Whomever I kiss, he is the one, sees him. Immediately he went up to Jesus and said, Greeting, Rabbi, and kissed him. Okay, now I just took a little liberality with you. But think about this. Judas has a sign he's going to give all the people with clubs. Why would he need a sign if it was obvious he was the one giving him up? He could just walk up and Jesus go, it's him. It's him. Take him. I'm good. We got weapons. Let revelation roll over you right now. He told the crowd, I'm going to give you a sign. Okay, I'm going to walk up and I'm going to kiss him on the cheek. That's him. Why would he need to do that if it was obvious to everybody who he was, that who the betrayer was? Okay. Verse 50, but Jesus said to him, friend, why have you come? This is equivalent to God saying to Cain, what have you done? Does Jesus not know what Judas is doing there? Verse 51, and suddenly one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut his ear off. Now, I don't know about y'all. Again, I'm a guy, been in the military. He is willing to take a sword out and cut the servant's ear off. Right? Right? If you know the rest of the story, they took Jesus away. Jesus did trial, right? We don't have anything other else recorded about what happened to Judas between Judas and the disciples, right? Do you notice how Jesus did not sell out Judas at all? I think there's a reason for this because he knew there were disciples that were willing to bear it, willing to handle the sword. Judas is one of the 12 that they had walked with for three years. Three years. Do you think the other 11 would have been okay with Judas just rolling around, chilling? I'm going to tell you from my perspective, this is, you won't find this anywhere in the Bible. You will not find this in the Bible. I have a hard time believing if they knew it was Judas... They just let him walk away. 
I mean, they cut your hand off for stealing a banana. You just gave up the Son of God. Like they could even justify killing Judas. To me, there is no greater example of love, right? And what did he say? To lay down your life for one another. Jesus laid down his life for Judas too. You want to talk about love. He allowed it to happen. And we all know the rest of the story. Well, if you don't know, go read it. I'm not going to tell you. You need to open your Bible. Y'all, I just, I want to, I wanted to share my heart with you today and I'm going to wrap it up now. Um, If you're struggling with believing that the Lord is not for you, you really need to get into the Bible. You really need to read the word and then let him talk to you on top of that. You need fresh revelation. There are so many stories that would argue that why would God do this to me? Well, God actually puts a lot of examples in the Bible. Why would God allow that to happen to me? He didn't allow death and disease in the world. Adam did. But he had a covenant with Adam, right, in the beginning. And what did God do? He didn't remove the result. He didn't remove the flame from the hand. But what he did do was go all the way back around and redeem you from it. He gave you all the power for healing in your body. You are the hands and feet. You were supposed to go out and preach the gospel. What's the gospel, y'all? It's not the first four books in the New Testament. The first four books in the New Testament tell us what the gospel is. The gospel is the good news. How are we getting away with telling people the good news is God did it to you? The good news is God wanted your baby more than he wanted you to have it. What? What? The good news is God lets you say that without killing you. That's the good news. Amen. I love you guys. I just want to take a minute. Um, If you're willing to, um, if you're struggling with believing the Lord is for you, I want you to stand up for just a second. Right where you're at. Okay. Amen. 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 And I want you body of believers to lay hands on these folks. Thank you for listening. For more messages and other resources, please subscribe to this podcast or go to our website at www.crosskingdom.org.